Welcome and thank you for listening into this webinar for educators called What Works Clearinghouse Evidence-Based Math, Reading, and Writing Tips for In-Person and Remote Instruction. Today you'll hear from experts and educators on different resources that the What Works Clearinghouse, or WWC for short, has produced on evidence-based instructional practices that you as educators can use in your in-person and remote instruction. We will also feature resources for parents and caregivers that you can use when you're talking to caregivers about how to support their child's learning at home or that you can share directly with caregivers. In this webinar, we'll show how the WWC and its resources can help you integrate evidence-based practices in your classroom in in-person, remote, or hybrid learning environments. We have prepared a handout that includes a list of instructional resources from the WWC and the Regional Educational Laboratories, or RELS for short. This way, you know where to find the instructional resources that we highlight today, as well as additional resources that are available. The handout is available on the WWC website, and you can also access it by clicking the link in the video description below. Now let's begin with an overview of the WWC and its practice guides. The WWC was established in 2002 to be a central and trusted source of scientific evidence for what works in education. The goal is to help busy educators and policymakers efficiently make decisions based on evidence from the most rigorous research. The WWC does not directly test or study education interventions, and instead, they summarize existing evidence for educators, administrators, and other stakeholders so they can help them access evidence to answer a range of questions about the effectiveness of education interventions. And all of the resources from the WWC are free to use. The practice guide summarizes the evidence and presents specific and action-oriented recommendations and examples that educators like you can use to address challenges that you face in your classrooms and schools. You can also find videos and written materials that provide additional support for implementing recommendations from each practice guide. Now our speakers will provide examples of math, reading, and writing instructional tips that you can adapt to use in your remote or in-person instruction. I'm John Starr, a seventh grade math teacher and a professor of education at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University. I study children's learning of mathematics in middle and high school, especially in algebra. This example focuses on having students look at visual representations to demonstrate how to redefine the unit when multiplying fractions. The problem says that Lori is icing a cake and that one cup of icing will cover two thirds of a cake. It asks how much of the cake Lori can cover with only a quarter cup of icing. To show my students how to solve this problem, I would use a short slideshow that includes visual representations. The first slide could include the image on the left, which is a cake that's divided into three equal parts. Two of the parts are covered in icing, as represented by the horizontal lines and the shading, and I would explain to students how two-thirds of the cake is covered by a cup of icing. I then remind students that this shows how much of the cake can be iced with one cup of icing, but that we actually want to know how much of the cake will be covered by a quarter cup of icing. I'd explain that to determine this, we need to also divide the cake into four parts, which students can do by drawing three vertical lines to divide the cake into four columns, as you see in the second image on this slide. The dark blue area, the area with both vertical and horizontal lines in the third image represents the amount of cake that Lori can cover with a quarter cup of icing. To determine the amount of cake this shaded area represents, I'd ask my students to count the number of parts that are covered in the dark blue areas to get the numerator. They can count the total number of parts then to get the denominator. So this means that two twelfths of the cake is covered 
with the quarter cup of icing. Lastly, I'd explain to students that they redefined the unit here because they initially treated the full cake as the whole unit when determining how much of the cake can be covered with one cup of icing. Then they redefined the unit and treated two thirds of the cake that was covered by the cup of icing as the whole unit when they were determining how much of the cake could be covered with only a quarter cup of icing. Hi, I'm Jane Porath and I've been a middle grades math teacher for about 25 years. I'd like to highlight a WWC resource that provides tips to parents and caregivers who might be supporting their children's learning at home. So the way I would use this is to share this resource with my students' parents and their caregivers who supplement their children's instruction at home and needed resources on how they could do that more effectively. I would also go over some of these strategies in a parent-teacher conference or any other time that I'm meeting with caregivers. An example from this resource demonstrates how to solve algebra problems in multiple ways. This problem asks students to calculate a restaurant bill with tip. And there are two different strategies that students often use to solve the problem and they're described here. The problem asks what the total restaurant bill is if you add 15% to a $16 bill. So using the mul first multiplication strategy, I would ask my students to multiply the bill by 1.15. I would also explain that they can multiply 16 by 15 hundredths to calculate the amount of tip which is $2.40, and then add that to the bill. With the second strategy, I'd have my students break up a tip and calculate a tip of 10% and a tip of 5% to get the total tip amount of 15%. Then I'd have them add the two parts of the tip together to get the total tip amount, which again is $2.40. Then I'd explain to my students that they can use either strategy to get the same answer of $18.40, as the total bill, including the 15% tip. So in addition to the resources that we just described, the WWC has other math resources. The first three, three resources on this list contain recommendations for math educators of students in elementary and middle grades. The last two resources focus on recommendations for parents and caregivers. The way I would use these resources is to share them with my students, parents, and caregivers and explain that they include strategies and tools that they can help their children learn mathematics at home. Now we will transition to examples of instructional tips for reading and literacy that can be used with remote instruction. I'm Rachel kuhn -Mincy, and I've been teaching for 11 years now for grades three and four, and also have my master's in reading education. The example on this slide focuses on developing students' awareness of segments of sounds in speech, and how they link to letters. This type of activity is taught after students have demonstrated proficiency in isolating phonemes, the smallest units of sound in a word, like the p sound in pig or the d sound in dig. In this example from the full practice guide on how to help students link segments of sounds to letters, the focus is on the letter P. For this skill in my own classroom, I would name the letter and show students a visual representation of the letter, both in upper and lower case. Next, I would model saying the letter and the sound that the letter makes out loud and have my students echo back to me the letter and the sound that it makes. I also find it helpful to point to my mouth when I say the letter and its sound so that students pay attention to how the name of the letter and its corresponding sound forms. Each letter would also be accompanied by a memorable picture of a familiar word with the phoneme like in this example on the slide of the pig. As well as this, teachers can tell a story that incorporates the corresponding sound of the letter so that students remember the character and sound when they see the letter in print. The teacher may extend this activity by asking students to think of other words that begin with the same sound and then explicitly use this technique again when practicing other letter sound relationships. This year, I have worked in both a completely remote setting and then moved later to a hybrid learning setting in which my students return to school at different times throughout the year. Thus, I have learned how to modify my classroom practices to the remote setting. A simple way to adapt this recommended practice for your virtual students 
such as during a lesson conducted over a video conferencing application, is to pre-record a video of yourself demonstrating the recitation of the letter and sound with the memorable picture included and ask students to practice with you as if they were in the classroom face-to-face. -face. During live meetings, students may be able to communicate with you and you will be able to hear their pronunciation of the letter and sound. There are other applications that you can use that allow you to screencast or show yourself on video while at the same time displaying slides on the screen. I find these tools helpful for students who may miss live sessions or need to review material for additional practice. Hi everyone, I'm Sharon Vaughn and I'm a professor of education at the University of Texas at Austin. I have experience investigating uh, effective interventions for students with both reading difficulties as well as students who are English learners. I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples about effective practices that can be used in remote instruction as well as face-to-face -face instruction for students with elementary and middle school backgrounds who are English learners. And as you know, educators can support English learners and students with reading difficulties by using oral and written English instruction in content area teaching. And in fact, the content area can be one of the most strategic ways to help these learners because content such as social studies and science is so rich with opportunities to use language and to learn new vocabulary and concepts. So you might use some instructional tools like a short video to help students make sense of some of the content that you are interested in focusing in, whether it's in person or in a remote instruction. So as you look at the slide, one of the examples that you might see is from a social studies lesson. And this lesson was done specifically with grade eight students, but the example can be applied with both younger students or older students. And in this example about Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott, you can pre-teach, that is teach prior to asking students to read or addressing the content, critical words or phrases. And in this case, boycott, refuse, and colored sections section are examples of key concepts related to this lesson. And you can define and provide examples of how students can use these words, or in some cases, phrases, both orally and in writing. And you can also provide students with a list of questions and prompts that will help them answer after watching the video, and in this case, on Rosa Parks. This example brings together both oral and written English and it also gives an opportunity through pre-teaching by using a video to help build these constructs, making access to the content or the text easier. In addition, the example uses this short video as a way to serve as an instructional tool or springboard to help students make sense of the content. In other words, the goal is to build background knowledge key understanding of words and ideas, so that when students encounter the text or the content, that's the focal point for the instruction, they are better able to learn and understand. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that the What Works Clearinghouse has many resources for supporting literacy skills for students in the middle grades, as well as adolescents. And I'm gonna walk you through one of the recommendations from one of the What Works Clearinghouse practice guides, which is called Improving Adolescent Literacy, Effective Classroom and Intervention Practices. This strategy in this recommendation from the practice guide can be used in remote literacy instruction as well as face-to-face -face instruction. Educators like you can provide opportunities for students to engage in and extend their discussions, an important mechanism for promoting learning and language development for English learners, focusing on texts that they're reading. Discussions can be integrated into virtual instruction 
as well as the way you would integrate them into face-to-face -face instruction by using small groups of students to encourage them to discuss in these breakout groups. As you know, several platforms, probably some that you are already using, like Zoom, offer this feature. To encourage students to discuss the meaning of what they're reading and the focal key ideas of what they're learning, it's important to implement some of these strategies. And I'll identify a couple of them for you to consider. Before you're having the discussion or asking students to discuss key ideas, select materials your students will find engaging and create discussions and questions that encourage students to think reflectively about the text. So for example, if you're reading The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, you might show videos or news articles that help students get a sense of what was going on historically at that time. Help them understand the setting for the book. In this case, it was Chicago in 1984. So you might use one or two minute videos taken about Chicago in 1984. These videos or examples or pictures, news articles can provide students background on the context of these major events. And then the discussion can promote ways in which students can understand similarities and differences between the students' lives and their lives. These materials and discussions might deepen students' understanding of the characters and events, might create more access to enriched vocabulary, and provide opportunities for them to use these ideas and this language in follow-up discussions. By asking follow-up questions, we can encourage students to do the same to extend and deepen their discussion. By do the same thing, I mean learn to ask each other these questions learn to follow up. So for example, follow up questions can ask students to show examples from the text they're reading, go back into the novel and back up what their insights or observations are. So it's not just their opinion. What does the text of the author say to help justify or support their point of view? Students can have insights or observations and then ask other students if they have similar insights or observations. In other words, share what they know, but also encourage others to expand on or provide counterexamples to what they express. Have a structure or a clear format to the discussion that students can follow. This will help students to read a passage and understand it because they can expect a format for the discussion, and as they read, keep that in mind. You might do this alone, meaning students read by themselves or in pairs, or you can read the passage together. Then students can take turns in different roles. So for example, a student can be a leader who guides the discussion. One student could be in charge of making predictions about what will happen next, using the text as a data source for those predictions. A third student might serve in the role of identifying confusing words or asking students to identify those words and then reading around the text to see if they can clarify. A fourth student might be in charge of summarizing the passage and working with the team or group to provide those summaries. As these roles are completed, other students can respond and join in. And teachers or educators can listen into the groups and redirect the discussion. They can model some of the thinking strategies, or they can guide the students by providing model questions to probe for more information. Using discussion protocols, and by a protocol, I mean a set of guidelines or steps that teachers can follow when leading a discussion. It gives students opportunities to think deeply about what they are reading, and these protocols provide a guide to make sure that students are using text as a resource to guide and justify their comments. For example, a discussion protocol might include the following approaches to encouraging a high quality discussion, such as the guide might ask students to explain their positions, provide evidence of reasoning from the text to support their positions, model a reasoning process for students by thinking aloud 
are proposing counterpositions. They might even recognize good reasoning when it occurs and summarizing main ideas of the discussion as it concludes. Thank you, and now I am gonna pass it back to Jane Choi. The WWC has developed suggestions for how middle and secondary school writing teachers can apply recommendations from practice guides to inform their remote instruction. This example focuses on using breakout groups to have students collaboratively brainstorm and prepare for writing using a graphic organizer or peer feedback. To adapt this strategy for remote instruction, you might ask students to share their brainstorming work or their writing online, and then use digital breakout groups. This is a feature included in most remote learning software applications. Once students are in their breakout groups, you can ask them to read each other's work and report on one another's ideas and provide feedback. You might need to provide students with guidance on how to provide helpful and appropriate feedback to one another. One way is to share sentence starters for students to personalize. Examples of sentence starters are, I like your opening sentence and paragraph because, or an idea I have to make your body paragraph stronger is, Students will then complete the rest of the sentence with the feedback they want to share with their classmates. In addition to the resources we just described, there are others we'd like to highlight. The first is a website that has a professional learning communities guide to support reading educators of kindergarten through grade three. The other two resources are ones that educators might share with their students' parents and caregivers who are supplementing their children's reading instruction at home. There are also additional writing resources available. So the first three focus on writing instruction for the elementary grades, and the resources in the first two bullets focus specifically on practices in remote settings. The fourth resource is a webinar for writing educators of secondary students, and the fifth resource provides tips for parents and caregivers who are supporting their elementary school children's writing. So I'd like to conclude by providing you with several links that are also located in the handout linked in the video description below. Um, you'll find links on this slide on the WWC site, and it features all of the resources for educators, the full library of practice guides, and then the rapid evidence review of distance learning interventions. This webinar and other resources are all available on the WWC website. And if you have any questions about the WWC, the practice guides, or any of the other products, you can contact the WWC Help Desk using the link in the fifth bullet. Thank you very much for watching this webinar and for your interest in the WWC evidence-based tips. I hope that you found this useful and that you share this webinar and the resources with your colleagues.